Hello everybody and welcome to Law Bite number 254, dated May 16th, 2021. I'm Walter, your mobile historian and blue collar scholar. This Law Bite is entitled The 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, an overview. The 10th Amendment to the Constitution, sometimes referred to as the State's Rights Amendment, is the last rung on the ladder of the mighty Bill of Rights. Like its other nine counterparts in the Bill of Rights, the 10th Amendment protects freedom, rights, and liberty in general. Unlike the rest of its counterparts in the Bill of Rights, however, the Tenth Amendment does not have an emphasis on personal rights, but rather protecting the rights, freedom, and liberty of the individual U.S. states. So let's read the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. The Tenth Amendment reads as follows. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. So what in Sam Hill does that mean? Well, let's read it again and decipher it. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution i.e., the powers not given to the federal government by the Constitution, such as in Article 1, Section 8, where it contains such things as the power of the federal government to declare war and uh, raise and support armies and you know, regulate interstate commerce, so forth and so on, nor prohibited by it to the states. That is referring to specific things in the Constitution, specific powers prohibited in the Constitution to the states from exercising, Article 1, Section 10, by the way, such as uh, emitting bills of credit and coining their own money and passing ex post facto laws and so forth and so on, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Generally, this would imply that everything outside of specifically delegated power to the federal government and powers that aren't specifically prohibited to the states from exercising by the Constitution, the same, are reserved to the states to exercise legislatively and otherwise or to the people. Now, the, sex, the, the end of the Tenth Amendment stating to the people is a bit of, as I'd like to say, a uh, misnomer, as the Tenth Amendment has, to my knowledge, never been invoked to protect personal rights, per se, against federal power, but instead to protect the rights of states against seemingly overreaching federal power. Okay? So, we focus on what it was truly intended to do, and that was protect the sovereignty to a large extent, uh, the sovereignty of the states from an overreaching federal government, and to make sure that the federal government stayed in its own lane with respect to governing the country. The Tenth Amendment was meant to emphasize that even though the federal government was certainly supreme, in areas where it had authority, the state still maintained sovereignty with practically everything else. All right. And that was at the time this went into effect about 95 percent of things. OK, as time has gone on and uh, the power of the federal government has grown uh, substantially since the Civil War. All right. And the. Uh, adoption of the 14th Amendment, okay? As the power of the federal government has grown, state power has similarly been reduced. Not to Lilliputian uh, proportions, 
but it certainly is uh, no longer what it once was, all right? And given the massive uh, amount of federal money that the states live off of today, you know, it's often very difficult for states to survive uh, without those federal dollars coming in in some form, which, you know, dilutes the uh, abilities of the Tenth Amendment, uh, you know, in protecting their sovereignty as the power of the purse as you all well know, is a mighty one, and it is certainly one that the federal government uses to get the states to comply to things. More on that later on. So the Tenth Amendment was added to the Constitution essentially as a reminder, just like its counterpart, the Ninth Amendment, that the federal government is an institution of limited enumerated power. All right. And that powers that aren't there, the federal government theoretically should not be exercising or attempting to exercise. Makes sense. Right. I agree. However, in the minds of individuals in 17, uh, 88, 89, 90 and 91. OK, that was no guarantee, folks. And many people feared that the U.S. federal government would essentially try to become just like the British Parliament which is an institution that has virtually no limits on what laws it may pass, all right? And in order to preserve our federal system in this great land, where power is divided between a mighty massive federal government and several smaller local governments that we call states, the Tenth Amendment was added to the Constitution along with the rest of the Bill of Rights. Once more, to make sure we're perfectly clear and all on the same page. The Tenth Amendment emphasizes the rights of the states, all right? Whereas the rest of the Bill of Rights emphasizes rights and freedoms and liberties granted to, protected uh, for the people, all right? Not the states, all right? You already know the rest of them. Uh, the right to keep and bear arms, freedom of religion, free speech, protection against unlawful, unreasonable searches and seizures, right to counsel, jury trials, and so forth and so on, protection against cruel and unusual punishment. These are all rights, all right, that the common law and natural rights that the people, you know, have. And these were the rights seen as so essential to liberty, that they needed to be the ones added to the Constitution to prevent the federal government from stepping on them, okay? These were the people's protected rights against the federal government, all right? Absolutely, positively, these rights were uh, in, enshrined in state constitutions, but they wanted to make damn sure that the federal government did not interfere with these rights that the people had, and thus these were used as protection against federal power. All right, amendments essentially uh, one through eight. The ninth protected non-enumerated rights that the people had and the have, excuse me, not had, have. And the 10th amendment protects the rights of the states against an overreaching federal government. So let's move on, all right? So the 10th amendment essentially, like I said, is a truism, all right? Recognizing the fact that the federal government is one of limited enumerated power and everything that you know, is not granted to them to exercise in the Constitution or prohibited to the states from exercising by the Constitution is left to the states, okay? So we see that the Supreme Court has not, had not done, you know, a great deal of use and interpretation of the 10th Amendment before the 20th century, all right? So, thus, it has been acknowledged that the 10th Amendment added nothing to the Constitution whatsoever. It just merely restated the obvious, all right? So I wanna reference a quote uh, from a very important uh, decision handed down about 83 years ago at the time of this recording in United States versus uh, Darby Lumberco written by uh, Associate Justice Harlan Stone, all right? Affirming uh, an act of Congress against you know, essentially a 10th Amendment 
uh, challenge. All right. So Stone wrote that the amendment states, but a truism that all is retained that has not been surrendered. All right. There's nothing in the history of its adoption to suggest that it was more than declaratory of the relationship between the national and state governments uh, as it had been established in the Constitution before the amendment uh, or that its purpose was other than to allay the fears that the new national government might seek to exercise powers not granted. All right. And that the state's might not be able to exercise fully their reserve powers. So Stone is simply saying that the 10th Amendment is merely a declaration, reaffirming that the federal government uh, must stay in its own lane and that the states have their lane and are free to exercise in that lane, okay? What is able, what they're able to exercise, all right, outside of federally granted power, all right? And, you know, from 10th Amendment jurisprudence, the Supreme Court has emphasized uh, certain things that are worthy of mention. Uh, like with discussion of all constitutional amendments, they have been defined by Supreme Court case law. Okay? So, in its time, the Supreme Court has uh, withstood um, the power of the federal government to... Uh, essentially uh, require the states to do certain things while stopping the federal uh, government from exercising power in other areas, all right? So, you know, in notable cases in the past, such as uh, Wickard versus Filborn and Gonzalez versus Raich, you know, the court sustained uh, congressional enactments uh, via the Commerce Clause, you know, which has certainly been the primary engine for a substantial amount of federal uh, laws, all right, acts of Congress, you know, and the court uh, rejected arguments in favor of the 10th Amendment uh, in sustaining those federal laws in question in those cases, all right? Uh, so the Commerce Clause, you know, is a formidable opponent of those who would suggest that the 10th Amendment and protect a state against that clause when there is some sort of legitimate uh, interstate commerce uh, in play, all right? Now, the federal government has also rejected, all right, Tenth Amendment claims of state sovereignty, all right, when it comes to Supreme Court decisions, all right? Specifically in the case of Cooper versus Aaron, you know, the court emphasized that a Supreme Court decisions, just like any other federal law, all right, are the law of the land as essentially uh, enforced by the supremacy clause of the Constitution. And the states had to abide by the Supreme Court's decisions. This wasn't negotiable. This wasn't up for debate, all right? So the supremacy clause openly declares that federal law, which comes in the form of Supreme Court decisions, treaties, acts of Congress, all right, are this, is federal law is the supreme law of the land, okay? And states are not permitted to openly undermine the law of the land where it is clearly applicable to them. End of story, all right? Now, the Supreme Court has also ruled, all right, a very notable case uh, Garcia versus San Antonio uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority in 1986, applying the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act uh, to a um, governmentally run mass transit system that Congress certainly uh, had the ability to uh, require that the uh, mass transit system here abide by the Fair Labor Standards Act. All right. And that Congress had certainly provided a substantial amount of federal funding. Remember I mentioned that before? Federal funding to them as well. All right? So it's not like you're being pushed around with no incentive. Also, in that decision was emphasized the principle that the states, through the political process, could certainly check abusive federal power. And they can. There is absolutely nothing 
stopping the states from using the political power that they have to serve as a check on what they believe to be overreaching federal authority. Okay? That is a principle that was reinforced in the case of South Carolina versus Baker in 1988. All right? Now, that um, decision uh, had, in part of its uh, opinion, that, you know, the principle held in Garcia that, you know, Congress can certainly regulate this and it's providing money and whatnot, you know, that, um, and, you know, states had the ability to challenge it so they could protect their power through the political process. The court held that none of that essentially would be applicable or valid if the states lacked the ability to challenge the treatment in uh, the political process, okay? You know, and, you know, if it, the state was left impotent or powerless by the federal law, then the standards in Garcia wouldn't apply, all right, regardless of how much money Congress gave, all right? If the states lacked the political ability to challenge the law in any way, shape, or form, then Garcia, Garcia's standards uh, would not apply, all right? So, that said, the court has held also that Congress is prohibited from commandeering or forcing the states to do certain things, as emphasized uh, in the case of New York versus U.S. in 1992, all right? Uh, essentially having the states also on the hook for something they did not want to do in the first place, all right? So that's the anti-commandeering doctrine uh, as a part of 10th Amendment jurisprudence, all right? The 10th Amendment does protect states, you know, from uh, essentially blatant commandeering by the federal government. Maryland, you must do this. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. End of story, okay? Uh, also, you know, the 10th Amendment has been construed to prohibit the um, federal government from similarly uh, forcing uh, state officials to implement federal laws, all right, against their will um, in certain circumstances, all right? The case was Prince versus U.S. in 1997 from where that was uh, established, all right? You know, the law itself would require state officials to enforce this particular federal law. That essentially uh, is a form of commandeering, which is why, I, you know, I attached it right afterwards to make it make the most sense uh, in the world. All right. Again, Prince versus U.S. and New York versus U.S. All right. New York versus U.S. was 1992. Prince versus U.S. was 1997. All right. And last but not least, the issue of federal funding. Ah the power of the purse. Now, the Supreme Court has ruled, ladies and gentlemen, that federal funding may certainly be uh, given to the states, all right, under condition, all right, translated, the federal government may condition the dollars that it gives to the states in order to uh, require uh, and force the states to comply with federal law, you know. Uh, in a notable case, South Dakota versus Dole in 1987, the Supreme Court upheld a federal regulation that threatened to withhold a certain amount of highway funding if states didn't increase their minimum age to buy alcohol to 21. And the Supreme Court held that to be perfectly legitimate and rejected a Tenth Amendment uh, challenge to such uh, federal enactment, you know, and the court ruled that, you know, Congress can certainly condition how it gives out federal funds, all right? The little bit of money that the states were set to lose if they didn't comply with the law was not unduly coercive, okay? However, comma, the court has also ruled under certain circumstances that, you know, um, that particular type of funding, all right, may not necessarily be required for a particular federal law uh, to be unduly coercive, all right? So the funding issue aside, all right, 
Uh, the court ruled part of the uh, Affordable Affordable Care Act, excuse me, to be unconstitutional in 2012 in the case of National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius. All right, the court sustained the vast majority of the Affordable Care Act, but struck down a provision of it that um, conditioned uh, the um, provision of Medicaid funds on states um, to to in requiring them to expand uh, Medicaid el eligibility, all right? They essentially would have to have joined the federal program or they would have lost their continued uh, Medicaid funds um, if they, you know, did not include all individuals who fell below 133% of the poverty line, okay? so. You know, the court ruled that to be unduly coercive, all right? And another very uh, recent uh, decision uh, handed down in 2018, uh, the court uh, struck down a congressional enactment from 1992 uh, that prohibited states from banning sports betting, all right? Uh, and the court ruled that that uh, violated the anti-commandeering doctrine as well. Uh, the case was Murphy versus National Collegiate Athletic uh, Association, 2018. Okay, so the court has um, emphasized in Tenth Amendment uh, jurisprudence, uh, anti-commandeering doctrine, all right, and federal funding doctrine, all right. You know. States cannot be, you know, commandeered into um, doing things by the federal government. States cannot be, um, have their officials forced uh, to do things uh, by the federal government. Uh, and with the federal funding uh, requirements, the federal funding, uh, you know, stipulations cannot be unduly coercive. All right, as was emphasized in the Affordable Care Act case in 2012, like I said, where the states um, essentially were forced to join the federal program, you know, uh, or risk losing their Medicaid funding if they didn't dramatically expand their Medicaid programs. All right. Uh, also, the federal uh, government cannot force the states to do unconstitutional actions in order to receive uh, federal money as well, all right? So the conditions to receive the federal funding cannot be unduly coercive or they could be construed as a violation of the 10th Amendment to the Constitution, okay? So in conclusion, the 10th Amendment of, to the Constitution certainly, while no longer as you know powerful or as fluid as it once was, certainly protects the presence and the ability of state sovereignty to function outside the federal realm, okay? And it protects the federal government from going too far into areas that it perhaps should not be, all right? So the 10th Amendment, like I said, is more than anything a truism, reiterating the obvious that the federal government officially is one of limited, enumerated, and of course implied powers, and it is not designed to exceed those parameters, all right? Uh, if it is to exceed those parameters, those powers should at the very least be implied. Now, I just want to make it clear that I am not a tenther, all right? I am not a uh, believer in states' rights. What I am a believer in is the Constitution, all right? And that its terms should be as adhered to as closely as possible, Okay? So that about uh, wraps up the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, the last ladder, uh, uh, the last rung on the ladder of the Bill of Rights, all right? And its function protects the principle of state sovereignty and federalism. So if you have any questions or controversies, leave them down below. I'll be happy to answer them, all right? If you like this video or learned a thing or two from it, drop me a like. I'd greatly appreciate that. And uh, if you have not subscribed to my channel, 
I humbly ask that you do so now. It would, you know, greatly uh, be appreciated, folks. You know, I appreciate you for listening and getting this far if I haven't bored you to absolute death. All right. So take care. Be blessed. Stay safe out there. And I'll talk to you at the next bite. Peace.